Well, today we are starting a six-week series called Reveal, and I love that we're starting the new year with this series, Reveal, because God still reveals things to us, right? And what I love about Reveal is there is a sense of mystery in it, right? I didn't know something, it was revealed, and then all of a sudden I discovered something. And when I was a seventh grader, the whole element of mystery took on a different meaning for me. In fact, when I was a seventh grader, uh, one of my teachers read a book called The Westing Game. Anyone know this book? Anyone read this book, The Westing Game? It's a Newbery Medal winner. It, it was an amazing book. And, and normally when we had a book, I, I just really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. But there is something about this book that kind of caught my attention. And with each chapter, every day we would read, new things were revealed. And at the end, there was one of those moments you were like, oh my word, all of a sudden this all makes sense. The truth was revealed and all of a sudden all those pieces that fit nicely together and I see the whole puzzle. It was the day I discovered mystery. Anyone else love a good mystery book? Such a good thing. A lot of us have a favorite mystery author. Um, it reminds me of a movie that was probably the first time when I got to this movie. It, it absolutely changed the way I looked. Anyone see the, the movie Sixth Sense? You ever watch that movie? It was one of those movies that you just kind of, you, you thought it was a certain way, and at the end it revealed something. And I, I know there's some of you like, I'm going to go see it tonight. Don't tell me the end of it. It was 20 years ago if you haven't seen this movie. Um, but what was revealed at the end changed everything. And I don't know if anyone else was that, you, like, you had that moment and it was revealed, and you're like, what? That, I didn't know he was, well, I'm not going to say it, because if you haven't seen it, it would ruin the whole thing. But it was one of those things that was so shocking that you had to go back and watch the movie again. And, and all of a sudden, as you did that, you were like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, I get that part and that part, and all this stuff starts to make sense. What was revealed changed the story. Now, we love Reveal. Anytime that we have a concept where we can make money off it, we're all for it, right? And so you think about Reveal today, we have top-level high school athletes that have these Reveal parties, and they sit in front of the cameras, and ESPN will come and cover it, and they have four caps in front of them, and they reveal which college they're going to be at. No one puts on a gopher hat at one of those. I just, have you noticed that? What is up with that? Um, and then you have reveal parties like, uh, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, and so we're going to pay $500 to $1,000, invite people, and we're going to throw a ball, and we're going to hit it, and it's blue, it's a boy. Like, we have these reveal moments. Uh, we, we do this in the element of Apple and Microsoft have invite party only to reveal their newest and greatest things. And sometimes reveals aren't always great. Like there's, there will be a pastor who will stand in front of, a, of their, their flock and their congregation and they will reveal something that is so shocking and groundbreaking that it changes everything. You're a little nervous right now, right? <laughs> like for example, maybe they have all their life been a Green Bay Packer fan. It changes everything. And, and, and I'm just telling you, that's, that's, that's not true. Uh, I just make really poor decisions and have really poor bets. And, and then I have to suffer the consequences of wearing Green Bay socks because the Vikings didn't win. So you're like, whew, good, right? No, the reveal does stuff where it just, where it can change the story. And I love that we're in the, the church does this, this season. It's called Epiphany. And the Epiphany is the reveal celebration of when the divine is made known to humans. Where God reveals things that only God knows. And he lets us in on the secret. One of the authors that I'm reading right now is Hans von Balazer. And he's a great thing. He makes this comment about uh, Epiphany. He says, the reveal is the making known of the wonders of the divine nature and activity that were once concealed by the Father. And so there are things that only he knows that he is keeping on to, and there is moments where he intercedes in our lives to reveal something that we previously didn't know. And we see this in the story of the Magi today, which is a beautiful thing. 
something that was revealed to them that changed the way that they lived, changed the way that they walked. And there's two things we're going to focus in on today in particular, is we're going to focus in on the reveal and the reaction of the Magi. And I, and I love what happens. And you think about this, one of the things, and I, I know three weeks ago was a part of a series that we did, and on a Saturday we preached about this. We're, we're going to take it a little bit of a different angle today. But I love the fact that you think about this. We, when God was going to reveal something, sometimes we have this picture of how God's going to reveal things. Like, for example, we might say when God's going to reveal something, maybe it's on a Sunday morning when we're all together. But that's not what happened. In, in this time... When the, the Savior of the world, they have been waiting for this reveal for thousands of years. They've been telling their children about it. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. God's going to do something to fix the brokenness of what, what we are in. Everything we feel, the pain and the, the toil of everyday life, God is going to do something to fix this. When they, told, they would tell people, their kids... Their kids would tell their kids, just on and on and on. They couldn't wait for that day. And you would think when that moment comes that God in his wisdom would say, hey, when we are going to reveal this, we're going to go to the temple, the place where everyone expects it to be, and we're going to say, hey, guess what? Now is the time it's coming. But he doesn't do that. He actually reveals this, um, the most amazing reveal that ever has been to man, that, that when he reveals it is to outsiders, in a way that you would never expect. He reveals it to, to shepherds who are watching. Their, they're just doing their job at night. He does it to these magi who are these, these, these sorcerers. They're magicians who study astrology and the stars for everyday decisions. And here God reveals something in an incredible way so that they would know that the promise has arrived. The Messiah, the one they've been waiting for, is now here. Now, one of the things that I love about this story, about the Magi, that's what they did. They studied the stars, and they were known as wise men, right, that would come before the rulers and saying, hey, by the way, we've been studying the stars, we've been looking at things, and we've got some insight for you on the different things that are going on. And, and they were known for that. Now, they weren't looking to, they weren't looking to the word or anything like that. They weren't they, they weren't doing like the Israelites were. They looked to other means. And God used the things that they were looking at, the star and the sky and the universe, he used that to reveal the truth, which is just amazing. He met them where they were at. He met them where their stuff was. And, and when you start to think about this, this whole story, you can't help but just go, oh my gosh, God, you are supreme. Like you are doing things that only you can do that I can't even fathom or think about. He used the universe to communicate the greatest message ever. I think about it this way. So think about this. The sun, the star, the closest star to us, is, you think about that, when, when you see the light, now it, it's different for Minnesotas who don't see light for six months, but <laughs> imagine you were in Florida right now, and the sun was out, and, and think about this. In the morning, you wake up, and you see that light. Now, that light didn't happen just right then. It happened 8.2 minutes ago. So the light that left the sun at that point took 8.2 minutes to get to you so you could see it, which means this. If ever the sun goes out, you have 8.2 minutes of pure enjoyment before darkness. It's, it's pretty amazing, isn't it, to think about that vastness in the universe and how far that is away, which is incredible. The next closest star is the Proxima Centura, which is 5.8 trillion miles away from us. So the light from that star takes 4.2 years to get to us. I mean, think about that. 4.2 years to get to us. And when you start to think about that God was using a star to communicate to these magi, that God's plan and communication was already in plan before the Christ was born. It, it, think about it this way, which it just it kind of blows my mind of what, what is happening in here. Now, I know there's a lot of different theories that are going on. Um, there was one... Um, there was one theologian that I listened to that was also an astrologer who said this may be 
the event that happened at this time might have been one of those events that only happens every eight years where Saturn, Pluto, the sun, and the earth all collide at a certain spot that the light is the brightest and only happens every 800 years. So most people don't even get to see it. He said that could have been the moment that they saw this and they saw all the alignment. And they said, this is the moment. Something's happening because this is rare. No one sees this. Now, we don't know if that's actually true or that's a, it's a theory that's out there. But what I know is true if, if he's communicating through the stars and we have become to know all the, the vastness of the universe and how amazing the universe is, all I know is God put in a plan to communicate something far before the plan started to develop. That God in his infinite knowledge already put a plan into place to tell them and to reveal to them the truth that the Savior was coming even before the Savior was born. I mean, doesn't that just make you go, wow, we worship a God that's just so much bigger than we can even comprehend. God hasn't revealed the supremacy and how amazing he is because I don't think we could even handle it. And what I love about these magi is when they have this moment and they see this star, you know, as Sheila said, they, they drop things and three things happen. There was three reactions that I want to focus in on. One of them is this, when God reveals something to us, it's going to require sacrifice. We can't just see what God says to you and go, well, you know, that's really nice. Now I'm going to go on and watch the football game. Yeah, when God reveals something to us, it requires something of us. We can't just go, well, that was nice. What did the, the Magi did this? They were in a far land. In fact, they believe that there's probably 500 mile journey on foot that they went to see this newborn king. And that, that's, that's sacrifice, to leave their land and the people that they knew and their provisions and all that stuff and said, we're just here to follow the star. It requires sacrifice. It required the sacrifice of the disciples who had to drop their nets and follow Jesus when he invited them. It required sacrifice of, of, of Paul who gave up his life and his position to go on to these missionary journeys. It requires something of us. We can't just be passive observers. It changes the story. The other thing it does is it, it does this. It reveals that God, when God reveals something, it stirs our emotions. And I, I believe this. This is something the church has to pay attention to today. I, I, I think sometimes, I mean, think about this. When it says in verse 10, it says this. When, when, they, when the Magi saw God's reveal, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. In fact, the Greek word for exceedingly is at the highest level. Like their joy was at the top of the bar. They saw the star and they just were like, I, I can't get more joyful than this. And I'm wondering in the church today, like, if, if we, when's the last time God's revealed to, to you something that you've said, wow, my joy was at the top level? And I think about in, in the moment, like did, when you were getting up this morning and you were, you were making your coffee and you were getting the, the kids out of bed and, and, and you were turning on the live stream, did you go, oh my gosh, what a great morning this is. Can you believe it? Like we have a chance to be in God's presence today. He's going to reveal stuff to us and he's going to say things to us. And I just can't wait to get to church. How many of you had that feeling? No, I don't want to know. Instead, how many times do we say, oh, how long is he going to preach? <laughs> Nervous laughter, I see it. <laughs> we, we almost get to this thing of, of, like, where is the stirring of emotion within us? I think we're in a day where two-thirds of all churches are in decline. They're, they're losing members. They're losing joy. They're losing hope. And, and so many times the church looks and goes, oh, what is going on? And look at our culture and things like this. What I want to know is, where's the joy in the church? A third of churches are growing. And here's what I believe. One of the things that I heard when I came here last, last, uh, last uh, spring is I heard people say this. I, I, there's joy in this building. When we come in here, there's excitement. There, there is things that are stirring and God is doing things. And this is what I love. It wasn't the answer of like, this is what God's doing. It's just like God's doing things. We just want to be a part of it. We want to gather around it. And I believe this. Like if churches were a place of joy, 
If, if people came in and said, I can't wait to be here, despite my circumstances, despite the things that are going in my life, I want to come into the presence of God, into the holies of holies, because God's going to tell me stuff and reveal stuff to me and to tell me things of, that he's called me to be. Like, ah, that's where I want to be. And, I, and I'm telling you, like, if, if this, if churches in the world were like that, you know what would happen? I don't think they would be, we'd be in decline. I think people would be saying, I want to go where you go. I want what you're having. I want to be and, and be a part of the things that you're a part of because you have joy in your life that I don't. I see an exceeding joy in you that I want in my life. And I see your circumstances, but you still have joy. I see, I see the doctor's results and things like this, but you still have joy in the midst of that. Why is that? And I believe the Holy Spirit would reveal Jesus like nothing else. Reveal stirs joy in us. And the third thing it does is it leads to, when it says in verse 11, it leads to worship. Here are these magi, and they come in, and they see the star leads them to the place, and they see Mary and Jesus, and they fall down, and they worship him. Now here's what I love about this story. Here's what I love about this moment. They, they, they worship him, it says in the Greek, because he was born king. He was born king. They knew there was something about him. You see, Jesus didn't do anything yet. He didn't cure anyone. He, there was no miracles at this point. He, didn't, he wasn't teaching at this point. He didn't do anything. They just knew that this was God's plan. And so they simply came into the presence of God and through his son, and they just worshipped him. I think of the song, The Heart of Worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come into your presence, longing just to know you, longing just to be with you, longing just to hear you. And it says this, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about the things in my life. It's not about what's going on. It's just simply about you. I love that. They came, they knelt, they worshiped, they gave him gifts. What would that look like for us today? If every Sunday, every Saturday, every day of our lives, we just woke up and we said, today is a great day of, of worship. And I'm telling you, to me, there's urgency. There's an urgency. When we look at the world today, we look at the world today, and we look at things. I love this. John says this in his gospel. John, in chapter 20, 31, he says this. He says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He, a chapter later, he comes back and he says this. So many more things could be written about Jesus in his life and all the things he did, but the reason we wrote this is because we want to reveal who he truly is, that he is the Savior and the Messiah of the world, and without him you have no hope. Without him, we are, we are under the judgment of damnation. But because of him, we have the hope that is the light of the world. And we simply have written this book. We've simply put this story together so that you would know who he is, that the reveal would happen to each and every one. When you think about the world and what's going on today, I, I think about this statistic. 31% of the world, according to statistics, believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior in their life. 31%. That, that is roughly, um, is, what is it, roughly 2.4 billion people. 5.5 billion people, 69%, have other hopes, have other beliefs, have some other reveal in their life, but it's not Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and think about this. Now, that's a big number, right? 5.5 billion. But if, if you think about that, that's roughly 2.5 per, people per us, right? Per person what if God is going to use you to move that number what if God is going to use you to reveal the truth of who Jesus is to one of those who has no hope and I think in the midst of this, I, I think we've got to be people that, that are, have two things on our hearts. And I think about this in years. We start this year, there's two things that we have to be a part of. One of them is this. We have to be people of the Word. We have to be in the Word of God. It's the number one way He speaks to you today. It's the number one way He's going to reveal His truth and new things to your life. We cannot live life apart 
from this. And let's, let me just frankly say it this way. We need to be in our Bible more than the news channel. We need to spend more time with what he is saying and what he wants to tell us than our favorite newscaster. Because God is going to reveal not the news, his plan, his desire, his heart, his urgency. We have to be people of the scripture. And the other thing is we've got to be people that are boldly in prayer. We've got to hit our knees and say, God, it is only through you that there's movement that's going to happen. You, through the Holy Spirit, you're the only one that's going to reveal the truth to people in our life. And I know most of you have people in your life that you are hurting. You're longing for them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And every day we should have a list that we are praying, God, God, would you move in their life? Would you use me or use other people in their life that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior? Because if you can use the universe way before the event happens to reveal it to outsiders on their term, God, you can do anything to the list of people that I want to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. we got to have an urgency in the church for that. This year, if we come before, that's, that's what God, this last week has really revealed to me. He said to me, he said, Derek, you just got to spend more time in my word, and you've got you to have a deeper prayer life. You, you, you've got to be on your knees more. You've got to depend on me more. It's not about you, Derek, and the things that you do. It's about me. I am the supreme. And so, God, I just pray, would you use us? Would you, would you help us when we come before you and you reveal things? God, would, would, would you just cause us to move to obedience and sacrifice? God, would you, would you move and stir our emotions that, that we just come before you with great joy, whether it's on Monday morning with a cup of coffee and opening up your word, or Lord, it's coming into your presence or coming into our work. Lord, would you just stir in us emotion and joy at the highest level? And God, I pray that we just be people of worship. Every day as we open up our, our, our scriptures, we worship you. Every day as we hit the knee, uh, we hit the floor on our knees and pray to you, God, just help us to worship. Because we simply come longing just to see something of worth. God, would you reveal each and every day Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life. And may that sustain us for whatever goes on in our life. Lord, we ask this in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.